Well, hello and welcome to the February 19, 2023 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana. Our contact information is at the end of this video. Please use it to find out our church hours and so that you can come and be a part of one of our services as well as our location. Use it also to get our email if you want to email the church and ask any questions or our telephone number. And we would love to hear from you. And we are Hammond's Bible Church. We are a church that tries to do everything from God's Word. And you'll see even in this text that we'll be studying in this video, Revelation chapter 19, how we try to understand what the Word of God is saying and how it should impact your life. Now, we'll get into the um, book of Revelation in a second. First, we're going to trans, uh, transfer over to our music ministry. And then after listening to some really encouraging um, music from them, we're going to transition back and we'll study God's Word. So have a Bible ready because, again, being Hammond's Bible Church, we want to drive everything from God's Word.
Please open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19 and verse 1 as we get back into our jet study tour of the book of Revelation. And if you haven't been with us in prior videos, understand that we have been doing this jet tour since last year of the book of Revelation. It took a break for the Christmas season and then the 2022 planning messages that I started the new year with. And so now we're getting back into our study of the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, book written by the Apostle John, we believe in about 95 AD from the island of Patmos. And a jet tour is between a topical message and a verse-by-verse -verse study. And as you should know, as being Hammond's Bible Church, we like to regularly teach just that way. So we're teaching the whole counsel of God and not just giving the pastor's opinion and you got to watch that with topical messages because they can be slanted not you can't do topical messages but the good healthy steady diet should be from verse by verse teaching now as we come to this study very much aware that this is between a topical message and a verse by verse study as we're trying to move through the book of revelation and give the big picture and as you come to chapter 19, the big picture is on the return of Jesus Christ. And if you had sermon notes in front of you, which I've sent those out to our church, and I always tell people in these videos, if you're interested in having those sermon notes, email our church and we will send them to you. But the theme of this passage is all about understanding the return of Jesus Christ to earth. The 19th chapter is got that theme. And, and so it is the big picture of how... Jesus Christ is returning to earth. Now, as a recap, just to get everyone back up to speed, remember that the book of Revelation is about the unveiling of Jesus Christ. So this is where we're getting at. The unveiling is how he is coming to rule and reign over the earth. And the book, as we come to the book of Revelation, is something that can be understood. We said that when you come to chapter 1 and verse 19, that the author, John, gives an outline for the entire book, and that outline is that he tells us that he was supposed to write what he has seen, what is, and what will be. Well, it works out really well that chapter 1 is what he has seen when he sees the image of, of Jesus that is no longer this 30-year-old. It is a very terrifying image of Jesus. He, that's chapter 1. Chapter 2, the seven churches of Revelation, what is the current status of the church. Um, different churches throughout the ages will have those seven characteristics. We don't believe they're just going to um, be different timelines, but we believe they are different um, statuses of the church at any given time. 
and then what will be is the majority of the book, chapters 4 through 22, as John is writing the events that are considered the events of the end times. Now, when he writes this letter, he's writing it to seven churches who are the recipients, those are the churches that are listed um, in chapters 2 to 3, the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. We said those are real churches, those are real people, and if you would go to modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia, you could do a, a circuit route, and you would go exactly in that order, go from Ephesus, go north, come back down, and you would come back to Laodicea. So the, it is a book that is rooted in history, in the sense of what has already occurred, what was there at the time when John wrote it, and it's something that we can understand that is something that is understandable from this uh, understanding that there's a clear timeline given in this book. And in the past, I've given charts out that you can understand how the 70th week of Daniel, which we believe the book of Revelation ties to explicitly, the seven-year period can be seen throughout the book of Revelation as you go through the seal, trumpet, and bull judgments. And then you go into the return of Christ and the thousand-year reign and then the eternity. And on Sunday, when I do preach this message in service, I will put up a chart, a chart that I've been using throughout the entire um, study. And my hope and my understanding is that people can have a visual look at this. And so if you're interested in that, I'll send you that as well. But the idea here is that this book is understandable. And I think that's so key for us as we at Christian Fellowship Church follow what is called the grammatical historical hermeneutic. That is just reading principles that are normal. And when we come to what is often called apocalyptic literature, we continue to use the same hermeneutic. It is absolutely foolish for somebody to say, now I'm going to treat the entire book of Revelation as allegorical. No wonder there are so many different fr people frustrated, so many different meanings out there on the book of Revelation, and they just throw their arms and say, well, it's a book that you can't follow, you can't understand. You use a hermeneutic with double meanings and the fact that the author doesn't understand his own intent. Well, that's going to leave you with foolishness. And that's not what we believe. Um, we're going to do a study of uh, teacher training principles uh, and te teacher principles uh, in March. And my hope and my desire is I'm going to reinforce the, the grammatical historical principles that we have in our, we have in our, methodology of interpreting the scriptures. Well, all of that to say, and Mike, you're, I'm digressing, I get that, is the idea is that this is a book that can be understood. And so when we come to like chapter 7, and John mentions 12,000 from every, every tribe of Israel, well, why shouldn't the number be 12,000? We're not going to look at that and say, well, it doesn't mean that. It means uh, an indescribable number. No. And so when you come to the thousand years in chapter 20, it means a thousand years. And especially the way it gets reinforced over and over and over. And then when you come to 24 elders in this chapter, it, it has to mean 24 elders, the number 24. But when John in chapter 7 wants to talk about a multitude that no one can count, he'll say that explicitly in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. And then when he talks about images that, that he, perhaps he's never seen or no one's ever seen, like in chapter 9, he talks about the locusts with the word heads and the armies of horsemen with breastplate of fight of fire. Then the literal doesn't make sense. And remember, the hermeneutical principle is if the literal makes sense, seek no other sense. So I can understand 12,000 Jews, or I can understand the thousand years, right? Those literal sense. But these locusts with these heads and these breastplates and on these armies, that doesn't make sense. So we've got to recognize that the literal doesn't sense, make sense, so we're going to try to do our best to say when these things do appear on the scene, they're going to have some resemblance to the imagery that John has drawn up for us. So all that to say is, look, you know, when we started our study, we went back to chapter 1, and it talks about the fact that, I believe it's verse 3, that says, you know, blessed are those who read and heed this book. What do you mean, heed it? Well, have it impact you. This book isn't filled with commands. It's, it's the understanding of what's going to happen, and when you understand what's going to happen, it should impact you. So that's a concept to consider, especially when we come to this 19th chapter. We want it to be something that impacts you because we're going to look at, I believe, one of the greatest events in all of human history. 
And I thought a lot about that because, you know, like last weekend when um, um, on February 12th, which will be a week from when we're going to broadcast, initially broadcast this video, is the idea is that we watched a Super Bowl, a sporting event that many people in America watch. It's a called ultimately, it's often called the ultimate football game. Well, it's not the ultimate from the sense that it's the last time it's ever going to be held. You know, if Jesus doesn't return, they're going to have another Super Bowl next year. And they're going to have another Super Bowl after that if Jesus doesn't return. Well, there's three events that are, I believe, the ultimate events in all of human history. And this is one of them. The first one is the fact the birth of Jesus Christ. Only one time God's going to become a man. And that happened some 2,000 years ago. Second, we have a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's the second great event. We recognize it with Good Friday and then what many people call Easter Sunday. I'll give them that term for now. But that, those are the two top events. And then the reality of it is, is that changes everything for you and for me. The fact that God becomes a man and then we know he dies and pays the penalty for our sins so that we can have eternal life. But there's a third event that's coming. A third event that doesn't get a holiday. <laughs> the first two get holidays. Right? We have Christmas, we have Easter, and we celebrate those. But the third one doesn't because it, it is probably going to be rejoiced about for all eternity <clears throat> as we celebrate the return of Jesus to earth. And so, as we come and we talk about this event, this event, look, you know, we're not looking back, we're looking forward. So, look, I know you, we look back to Christmas time, we look back at Easter time, and, and it's impact us. Well, look forward to this event and have it also impact you. And that's what I'm hoping that this study does, because, again, there's no exhortations in this passage. But it's something that I believe if you understand it's true, it should impact you. Even if you never see it in your lifetime, which a majority of Christians are never going to see this event. I get that. And I know, again, there are pastors that can get people all worked up. And it's something that I don't want to do that it, by date setting or anything along that line, that it's right around the corner. I recognize we're always supposed to be living in light of end times. I recognize the fact that we are people that... Um, God wants us to live in light of end times. How do I know that? Because of the many mentions about end time events throughout the New Testament scriptures. But the reality of it is that I can't date set, so I don't know when it's going to occur. But I, at the same time, I want you to live in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is returning. And as we go into this study, how's it going to impact you? And, 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 you know, because there's no direct command, I think God wants that to be something you're going to meditate on, you're going to think about regarding your time, your talents, and your treasures. And so the more you think about end times, the more you will be using your time, your talent, your treasures for God. So let's look at this um, chapter. We're going to start, we're going to do a two-week study on it. It basically breaks down into this, that we're going to look at the joy over the victory against evil, first and foremost. So we're going to have the joy over the victory against evil. And evil is the embodiment of, uh, of a principle of Active aggression towards good, okay? Active aggression. And it's not just sin. It's evil ratchets it up. It's something more than that. And so as we come to this chapter, the first part deals with joy. Um, and it comes from the, the praise that's given God. It comes from the hallelujahs that go out. So let me just read verses 1 to 6. And it says, And after these things I heard... Something like a voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Verse 2. Because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood, the blood of his bondservants on her. And then verse 3. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you as bondservants who fear him, the small and the great. And I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of many peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And I just want to add this bone at verse, verse 7. He says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And so you see... Who's giving this? Verse 1, there's a loud voice of a great multitude. Okay? And this multitude is crying out, 
Hallelujah in verse 1, Hallelujah in verse 3, um, the 24 elders are falling down. It's a different group saying, Hallelujah, Amen. And then um, the multitude comes back with Hallelujah. Um, so three times it's a large group, one time the 24 elders, and they are crying out with the idea of giving God praise. And where's the key? And whether it's John Walbert, John MacArthur, Warren Wiersbe, people have studied in this, all of them say, look at this, after these things, well, what are these things? Well, again, there's been a progression, seal, trumpet, and bull judgments that we just saw all wrapped up in chapter 16. And what happened in chapter 16? We saw the Battle of Armageddon. And, poof, you know, and, and that that is still being played out, okay? I want you to watch it because this chapter takes us into the final parts of chapter of, of, of the Battle of Armageddon, all right? So, but right when everything came down and, and we saw the Battle of Armageddon where Jesus Christ returns, I mean, wins, okay? And um, the, the idea of... <laughs> that God basically sends the giant hailstones and, and we saw the, the angel pouring out the, the wrath. We didn't actually see Jesus return yet. That's coming here in this chapter. But what happens in chapters 17 and 18 is, hey, just before we're all said and done, let me tell you about the Babylonian harlot. And the Babylonian harlot was this entity that is influencing false religion, which is chapter 16, and all bad, all bad pursuits from an economic standpoint, that people value money and glory for, for themselves and, and th this economic system that the world has played off on. So the idea is, is that, that this Babylonian harlot's been destroyed, Satan's destroyed her, and God's allowed it to happen, but then things associated with her, God has also brought to an end as well, the great city. And so if you're interested in knowing more about how Babylon... Um, the great whore has been destroyed. I'd go, I'd recommend you going back to those videos. But it's in light of the fact that evil is now done away with. Almost. Because Satan still hasn't been dealt with. And the false prophet hasn't been dealt with. And the Antichrist hasn't been dealt with. That's all going to happen in this chapter. So what you have here is th that John is now telling us the sequence of how things are playing out. And you get this fourfold hallelujah. Some of your Bibles even have a um, heading, fourfold hallelujah. And, and it's an incredible roar. And as one commentator said, the roar is a sound. It's, it's, it's great. It's, it's a word that's been used so often in the book of Revelation. And now it is like a deafening roar. And, uh, and all of a sudden you get this hallelujah. And hallelujah is a word I have trouble spelling. <clears throat> but what does it mean? Well, it's a word that means praise the Lord. And it's one of the few words in the Bible that is transliterated. Do you understand the difference between what is translated versus what is transliterated? A translation is like I have a word, Greek word agape. And instead of leaving it agape, when I come to like 1 Corinthians 13, since it was just Valentine's, you know, we, we, you know, what is patient, kind, not jealous? Well, it's agape. When we don't use the word agape, we translate it into the Greek word love. So love is patient, love is kind. But when you have a transliteration, you have a word that the translators have basically given the same sound as to what it was in the original language. So you come to a word that, like the word baptismo in Greek. Um, when King James didn't want to have um, anyone challenging his sprinkling in the Anglican church of people they were baptizing, which they were baptizing infants, which is crazy because infants have no idea what they're professing, but they sprinkle these babies. And so if you translated that word to the word immersion, then you'd say, go out and immerse them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that that would make people say, well, why are we sprinkling? So King James said, I want this transliterated. So whenever you see the word baptismo, we get an English word baptismo, a form of bat baptism. 
So when you come to the, the, to the um, book of Revelation, chapter 19, if you want to know a Hebrew word, it's hallelujah. Sometimes spelled with an A, hallelujah. But it means praise the Lord. Now, which is interesting, in the Bible, I would think that you have probably all through the New Testament. But these are the only four times it's used in the New Testament. It's used a lot in the Old Testament. We'll talk about that. Um, but it, it's, it, it is a sense of praise that is being given out because of the fact that there's a recognition of the victory in the Old Testament, uh, in, the, in the prior two chapters, well, really three chapters that's being recognized, you know, the Battle of Armageddon and the victory over the, the Babylonian harlot. And then we're looking also towards the final, final series of events that are going to happen in this chapter. So you got that? This is, this is the big picture of how evil has just been totally already vanquished, but is yet to be with its final... Um, destruction of Satan, the Antichrist, and the, and the false prophet, and anyone else that's still an unbeliever. That's still to come in this chapter, because remember, we're playing out the Battle of Armageddon in this chapter. So, I like what John MacArthur did. He did a really good job, I thought, of noting that there are five reasons for the praise. If we, we work through this, the five reasons. Number one comes from God's deliverance from, uh, deliverance of his people from their enemies. Look at verse one. Um, Salvation and glory and, pa and, and power belong to our God. So the idea is salvation is the deliverance. It isn't just deliverance that we're not going to hell. It's also deliverance that we're never going to have to deal with evil again. And so God is having recognition of people praising him because evil's been done away with. And anyone that has ever dealt with evil face to face, sometimes people say, that person's evil. That, that, that is just an evil thing that they've done. Yeah, you too are going to be thankful. Like, I don't ever want to see this again. And that's where I'm at. I don't ever want to see evil again. So there's a praise that God has delivered me officially ever, ever, ever from ever dealing with it. Or anybody being from dealing with it. And this multitude in heaven, which I think is a lot, could be a lot of people who are believers, um, people who, uh, who have just died naturally, as well as martyrs, especially martyrs, are just like, okay. Praise God that we're never going to have to deal with this again. And, and these attributes of glory and power are all being tied into our God who gets the recognition. Second, there is a sense of God meeting out his justice. Look at verse 2. Because his judgments are true and righteous, he's judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth and her morality. And he has avenged the blood of his bond severance on her. So yeah, you're definitely bringing in the martyrs. The idea of immorality is important for us to understand I believe is from the, the imagery, not just of, of, a, of a marriage gone awry. You know, somebody has sexual immorality, somebody gets caught up in porn. It's, 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 it's an unfaithful relationship uh, aspect there. But there's a study that we've done in the fact that religion is portrayed, religion is portrayed as sort of like a husband-wife relationship. You know, like the book of Hosea where God is upset uh, with the nation of Israel because it's like an unfaithful wife, right? And the idea here is that mankind has been unfaithful to God because the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. There's supposed to be a purity of devotion to the one true God. So when you follow Buddha or you follow following any man and uh, thinking that he is great over God, um, Confucius, any false religion, this is uh, a spiritual immorality. And so the idea of the Babylonian harlot was that she was influencing all the false religions. And, you know, we did an extensive study. And again, I encourage you to go back and listen to those videos that we did on her. And so there's a sense where because false religion has been responsible for persecuting true believers throughout history. And as I said in a previous study that we have said the 20th century was filled with more um, killings of Christians than any other century combined, that it, it was horrible what happened in the last century. We know that, it, that, that it's not stopped and that, the, that th these people deserve to be judged, right? And so God doesn't just sweep crime underneath the carpet and say, I'm not going to look at it. It needs to be punished. And, and obviously Jesus was punished for sin on the cross for what some of these people did. 
and obviously all, all that we did. But if they didn't have it applied to them, it, judgment needs to go out because if you don't accept Jesus Christ and you come to be a believer in Jesus Christ, judgment is going to come to you. So that's what has happened. And, and even though now we recognize that we deserve judgment, but we're saved by grace, we recognize God's totally just in bringing out that penalty. So that's what's happening here. And it's praise like, God, you finally got him. Third, we recognize the permanent crushing. The idea is in verse 3 when he says, and the second time they said hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. The idea that it's forever and ever and ever is the idea that it's never going to rise again. It's never going to stop. The judgment is permanent. Evil's not coming back, people. And, and, and so the way that religion has been played out over the last, you know, well, all of human history, it's done. It's never going to be played out. Satan's going to get released at the end of the thousand-year reign, but it's not going to be the same. It's not going to be where a very entrenched religious system gets set up. So the bottom line is there's a, a sense of a permanent crushing of man's rebellion. And then fourth, we're recognizing God's sovereignty. You can look at verse 6. It says, the hallelujah, at the end of verse 6, for the Lord our God, our God the Almighty reigns, the omnipotent. We're going to, we'll talk about that. There's a sense of God is sovereign. No one's ever going to overcome him. And I think that's why it's so good for you to contemplate what team are you on. So I've been trying to say, what, how, how is this chapter going to impact you? Well, the reality of it is, is you want to think, well, what team am I on? What side am I on? The, I want to be on the winning team, right? You know, if in the last Super Bowl, you, I want to, you know, if I was going to make a bet, I want to bet, you know, just straight up. I'm going to bet, as they say, bet, you know, without points, but I'm betting on the Chiefs. I want to win. If I want to win money, right, and, and that's what we, all, we want to win. I want to be on God's team. He's the, he's the omnipotent. He's the winner. No, no one's ever going to be rising up and be more powerful than him. And as we often have said before, in the battle of good for evil, there really isn't a battle. There, there's a sovereignty where God's letting evil have some leeway. But in the end, God wins. And then lastly... There's praise for the communion with his people down in verse 7. That's why I read that. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Um, and the bride has made herself ready. We believe, and we'll talk more about it next study, that the bride is the church. And there's just a sense of rejoicing over the fact that we are going to now be face to face with our groom, God, Jesus Christ. And so these are all part of the praises. And so this song of these four attributes uh, emphasize um, God's attributes in the sense that we recognize who God is. And I found that fascinating. Warren Wiersbe was commenting on that in the sense that is it just that, that so much of this praise is tied to who God is, that he is one who is um, almighty. He is the, the Lord God. He is the one that is... Um, the Avenger. He is the one that has salvation, glory, and power. So it's fascinating if you go to look through these attributes, these actions of God, how this is what we're giving praise for. And not just the fact that it, it's it's over. So when you come to, to um, verse 6, that expression, Almighty, it's used six times in the book of Revelation. And it is a word that means omnipotent. And it would have been like a big slap in the face to the current emperor. You know, can you imagine if our president today called himself the Lord and God? You know, remember back um, in the days when John was writing, you had an emperor, you had a Caesar um, out of Rome, and the Caesar at this time was Domitian, and he had a title, Lord and God. And here you're coming out, and John's writing this book, and he's writing this letter, and he's writing this verse, and basically, he's like saying, you know, there's nobody greater than him who, God, you know, not you, Domitian, not you, Caesar. And, you know, ironically, it didn't stop with Caesar's. You know, when Rome goes off the scene, you would continue to watch political leaders throughout the day um, claim to be a God, claim to be someone that's the almighty sovereign, when in actuality, they're just here for a brief amount of time, just absolute foolishness that anybody thinks that they rule and reign like a god. Well, as we come to this, 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 this section and we recognize, wow, this is 
looking back over the victory, looking forward to when it's all going to be played out here as the return of Christ comes and all the enemies are going to be destroyed. I found it fascinating that one commentator said, you know, you really need to understand this really is the essence of what the Jews often would do in give God praise. Um, there's a man named Alan P. Johnson. He wrote that when you look at Jewish literature, they're, they're, they have the literature called Hallel, very similar to Hallelujah literature, or praise literature. And specifically, Psalm 113, and we're going to look there in a bit, is Psalm 113, though Psalm 118 is known to be Hallel, praise literature. Listen to what he says. Hallel is the Jewish song of jubilation that has been accompanying our, wonder, our wanderings of thousands of years keeping awake within us the consciousness of our world historical mission, strengthening us in times of sorrow and suffering, the filling of our mouths with song of rejoicing and deliver, days of deliverance and triumph. To this day, it revives on each festival season the memory of divine redemption and our confidence in the future. And it's S.R. Hertz who said that, and Johnson was quoting him. And I thought that was interesting. So what, like you say, Mike, well, what's the gist of this? Well, the gist is, is that through the Jews, when they went through tough and difficult times, they would praise God, and it helps elevate them because it reminds them that in the end they win. And that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. For us who are believers in Jesus Christ, who have placed their faith in Christ, we win in the end. And so very similar to what the Jews use this to buoy their spirits, I'm hoping this buoys your spirits. That you come to this text of Scripture and you say, wow, you know, this is something that just lifts my spirits up. Now, just quickly, just so you can see it, I thought it would be interesting. We know that Psalm 118, Psalm 118 is what gets quoted on the day of the triumphal entry, right? Um, and, and this is just a section of scripture that might be good for you every once in a while to go back to and look at. Um, I, I, I thought it was kind of interesting. It really um, is often called 113 to 118, but I also know Psalm 111 and 112 go start with praise the Lord as well. So I just, I just added that, even though the, the Jews often consider 113 to 118, the Hillel section. But you look at 113, it says praise the Lord, verse 1, praise the Lord, praise the servants of the Lord, and just praise, 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 all through that, that, that psalm. And, and that's the idea of giving God praise. And, and so um, the idea of focusing on God, um, the idea of recognizing what he's done, uh, Psalm 114 is all about God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt. And part of these um, psalms were called the Hillel of Egypt as they recounted God's miraculous victory for them. And they would respond, even though if you don't have the word praise in it, you would say, you know, our God is powerful. He's the winner. And the implication would be that you would say praise him. And so, you know, Psalm 115 sort of does that very similar thing. And then when you come to the very last line in Psalm 115, verse 18, it says, what? Praise the Lord. And then you go into Psalm 116, and again, I love the Lord, verse 1, because he hears my voice and my supplications. And then when you come to the end of verse, uh, chapter 16, chapter 116, the very last line, verse 19, praise the Lord. Psalm 17, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Okay, it's the idea of giving thanks to God. Um, psalm 118 is a psalm of giving thanksgiving and praise to God. Um, the idea of, of giving Hallel, giving praise. And so we know that um, Psalm 118 is got that great line, blessed, verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? And then, but the line right before it, oh Lord, do save. What does do save mean? Hosanna. Hosanna is a praise, right? Which means save. So I just thought you'd like to see that section of scripture that sort of learns parallel in thought to one, um, to the first six verses of Revelation 19. So, you know, again, I'm trying to get you to think, because there's no command in this, what am I supposed to do with this? What, how's this supposed to impact me? And, you know, it's like this deafening roar, and I wish we could open up the pages and all of a sudden, a roar would come out. But you're not getting that. You're reading it, and, and it's resonating, uh, and maybe if you could, um, you know, resonating the words, but I wish it would resonate actually in our ears and we could actually hear it and, and it would just vibrate within us. To me, you know, I can make it akin to maybe if, if you've been to a sporting event, maybe you've been to a concert, large crowd, and the crowd was 
deafening roaring. I've been in both. I've been in concerts. I've been in um, sporting events. I've been outside of those events, and I've heard the deafening roar. And, and I can't imagine what this is going to be like. And I think the intensity is there is because uh, of where, as believers, we are supposed to be in hating evil. And I alluded to it earlier, and I still want you to, I want you to think about evil isn't just doing sin. It's what we're told to uh, understand as a principle. Um, and I would encourage you, if you want to, do your own study in the book of Proverbs and how evil is this entity, an entity that's against God, against that which is good. And the idea is, is that we recognize this is something that is just bad. And, you know, if you've been touched by evil or maybe somebody's murdered somebody in your family or raped somebody in your family or, or done something like that to, you know, something physically to hurt you, they've stolen from you, they've, they've you know, um, lied, uh, told you a lie. There's been people, when they, they tell lies, uh, they, they ruin people's lives with their lies. Um, it, it's absolutely abhorrent. And it is, it, to me, it's interesting that in, Revela in Romans chapter 12, when the Apostle Paul tells us to give our lives to God, and, and there's a, he gives those 25 attributes that have 25 Christian characteristics that are supposed to epitomize our life. And you just jot this down. Revel Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says that we're to have love be without hypocrisy but then we're to abhor what's evil and then cling to what is good. Well, the, there's the top three, and abhorring evil doesn't mean I just, I, I hate evil, it's I abhor it, there's an intensity to it. And I think that intensity comes out when you come to this hallelujah here. So think about, do I really hate evil, right? And, and would I have great joy if it ended? Well, yeah, I think you would, I really do. So my hope is that you would do a study on evil, you'd understand it better, and that you learn to abhor it. You actually learn to hate it with an intensity that is over just a normal hate. Well, all that to say is, look, the book of Revelation could be understood, and I understand Jesus Christ is coming again. The victory is guaranteed, the battle is over, and evil will one day be gone. So what do we do with this? Well, I'm hoping that you're always going to remember that evil loses. I'm hoping that you're going to always remember that evil people lose so you don't want to be on the wrong team and you're always going to remember our victory is assured for this one day is coming it's sure it's guaranteed and so it's almost if like again bringing back a sporting analogy if there's a game going on and we're losing 100 to nothing there's only one second left it's guaranteed that we're going to win and you say how's that going to be i don't know how god would pull it up but he would pull it out my point is is that we will win and that it may never be something you see in your lifetime, the return of Jesus Christ. You might come back with him, but in the light of the fact that you have this chapter, live in light of it and be thankful and be praised in God. And you can live in peace, you can live in holiness, and you can live in service to God knowing that your team wins. And it all starts when you come to faith in Christ, believing in the gospel, uh, that you're a sinner, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Jesus is God, man, who died on that cross. His death was a substitutionary payment. His resurrection proves that the payment was accepted by God the Father. But you have to believe this and believe it by faith alone, not by baptism, not by church membership, not by thinking that even you can just walk an aisle. It's through your own personal belief. And when you do believe in that, you become born again. And if you're not changed, you don't believe. A person who believes is changed. And when you do that, you have a different perspective on evil. And when you see evil finally defeated, you're going to roar and cry out hallelujah as well.